Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Canada's west coast features quite a unique rainforest, one whose biodiversity has always fascinated ecologists, the Pacific Temperate Rainforest. The humid Pacific winds unleash a phenomenal amount of rain on the west coast, up to five meters per year. Indeed, it's the wettest region in North America. Water gushes everywhere, creating roaring waterfalls and powerful rivers before flowing into the Pacific Ocean. Water provides life along the way, and in certain places, the forest is sometimes akin to paradise. You're doing great, man. You think? Damien and Francois Xavier are seasoned explorers. The combination of their expertise makes for a fearsome team, which offers a new perspective on Canada's natural history. Their goal is to explore the most remote and inaccessible recesses of British Columbia in order to better understand the natural laws that govern them. Today, the two men are flying due north in their ultralight airplane. It's the first day of their great adventure, during which they'll explore Canada's unique West Coast ecosystem, the Pacific Temperate Rainforest. The rainforest stretches for over 2,000 kilometers along the North American West Coast, from the steppes of California to the boreal forest, and east to west from the coastal mountain range to the Pacific Ocean. What a gorgeous river. Did you see the color of that water? Yeah, it's beautiful. So, if I'm not mistaken, this river should lead us directly to the sea. We're almost there. The secret behind this ecosystem is its special bond with the ocean. In many places along this stretch, land and sea are so intertwined that it's hard to tell them apart. Indeed, the fates of these two seemingly very different environments are closely bound by a thousand-year-old cycle of organic matter, a constant flux of nutrients between the ocean and the forest. Did you see the size of those trees? What a great spot. Our adventurers will start their expedition with the seabed. Then they'll travel upriver to observe the mass migrations of salmon, a key species for the survival of this ecosystem. Along the way, they'll discover the fascinating world of the coastal grizzly bear. And finally, our two explorers will get to climb a thousand-year-old tree in the heart of the forest. Oh, that's the ocean coming up. Wow. Okay, I see him. Francois Xavier is meeting up with Tavish Campbell, an expert on the region's marine ecosystem. Together, they'll explore the waters of the Johnston Strait, smack dab in the middle of the rainforest. A spot Captain Cousteau once described as being one of the most diverse he'd ever explored. And there's the beach. <laughs> that should be doable, right? You think it's big enough? Yeah, it should work. Meanwhile, Damien will continue on northwards. His destination, a magical place that the locals call the Great Bear Rainforest. Be easy now. Too much speed, I need to slow down. Take your time, you got this. Yes! Nice! Nice! Oh, yeah. Whoa, perfect landing! And a beach landing! Woo! 
Fantastic! What a smooth landing! Have fun, man. Hi there. How's it going? Good. You made it. Yeah, I did. Whoa. Perfect. Good. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. How was your flight? It was pretty good, yeah. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. Really beautiful. Yeah. How are the conditions for, uh, for diving? Good. Yeah, they're looking really yeah. nice. Yeah. It's great having it calm. And, and the light is amazing. Oh, this light coming down is going to be awesome. And it's looking pretty clear, too. So. Yeah, I, I noticed. So where are we going exactly? Well, we're just going to go down. It's actually not too far from here, just down around the corner. Yeah. Um, it's a nice point that sticks out into the channel. You can see we have quite a bit of current here um, still, but it's slackening yeah. off and it's going to be slack tied okay. pretty shortly here. So how come you know so much about this environment? I've always been interested in it. And we, me and my sister started diving from a pretty young age. And it's just, you know, it's been our front yard in our front yard and our backyard for a whole lot. Yeah, it seems like you spend a lot of energy trying to protect this as well. Yeah, so for then. sure. And I think that comes I think that comes naturally to anyone who spends a lot of time in a certain area. Yeah. You know, is once you you just grow to know it and grow to love it, then you want to protect it. And for so long, you know, we dove around here, but it was only us that were able to see the life down there and the colors and we'd come up just ecstatic about these dives, just, you know, bubbling over with all this uh, enthusiasm and excitement. So now to be able to go down and you know have have cameras down with us and uh, bring some of this imagery back up to the surface is pretty exciting for us. The two men jump into the water equipped with oxygen masks and a radio system that will allow them to communicate during the dive. So, we're starting our adventure in the depth of the Johnson Strait. It may seem odd to begin exploring a forest by way of the seabed, but we'll soon see that part of the source of the abundance of the forest lies under the surface of the ocean. These two ecosystems, the marine and the rainforest ecosystems, form an indivisible whole. And between these two ecosystems, there's what's known as a keystone species. A keystone species is so crucial to its specific environment that the latter couldn't survive without the former. In this specific case, salmon is the keystone species. We'll see that Pacific salmon spend one part of their lives in the ocean and the other one in the terrestrial river system. And it's precisely this journey from ocean to forest that we'll try to follow. And Pacific salmon will act as our guides for the duration of this program. As we move along the cliff here, we're starting to see some plumose anemones. These large white things looking like cauliflower. And they're a filter feeder, just like these two worms. See these big fields of two worms? There's just so much life clinging on to these rocks. currents that we're feeling here are the exact reason there's so much life along this cliff. All these colorful species we're seeing along here, the majority of them are filter feeders. So when you're a filter feeder and you rely on the feed to come to you, it makes a lot of sense to be situated where the current is flowing past you, bringing lots and lots of food every day.
McTavish and Francois Xavier are swimming in a soup of plankton. It's the main source of life on this reef. Plankton is composed of tiny plant or animal organisms that drift along the currents of the planet's vast oceans. Plankton is crucial to the ocean's food chain. However, as it needs sunlight to survive, it can grow only in the first 40 meters below the surface of the water. This is known as the photic zone. The vast majority of marine species live in this zone. However, plankton eventually dies off and sinks to the bottom, thus continuously depriving marine life of sustenance providing nutrients. What allows this ecosystem to maintain its balance are what are known as upwelling waters. Upwelling waters are strong marine currents that well up from the depths, carrying along with them the nutrients that have collected on the seabed and propelling them towards the surface. It's this constant mixing of the ocean waters that allows this part of the world to be so full of life. Tavish and Francois Xavier have reached the end of the photic zone, but instead of plunging deeper in the depths, they prefer to head towards another kind of aquatic paradise. This place is really incredible. It's like entering a sort of seaweed forest. So this is a beautiful example of a bulk kelp forest. Look at this towering three-dimensional structure that it gives the ocean. The kelp forests play an incredibly important role, providing habitat for a number of different species in the ocean all the way up from the largest fish down to the smallest little invertebrates, including young rockfish and salmon. So this bull kelp is actually an annual species, and it's some of the fastest growing seaweed in the world sometimes growing up to two feet per day. So over the course of the season, this kelp will grow up to sometimes 20 meters in length, providing incredible structure in the ocean. Here we've come across a little bit of a, an urchin barren. But you can see after the sea urchins have moved through, all you're left with on the bottom is some encrusting coral and algae, and all the, all the seaweed has been eaten off the bottom. So if we turn this sea urchin over, we can actually see its mouth part here. So right in there, you can actually see it's eating two pieces of kelp right there. It's eating two fronds of bull kelp right underneath. So we've caught him red-handed. So historically, when we had sea otters on the, on the coast, the sea otters would prey upon the urchins and keep the urchin populations in control. And when the sea otter was hunted to extinction on this coast for its furs, then the sea urchins didn't have their natural predators. So the sea urchin populations exploded and subsequently they ate down all the kelp. And the kelp forests like this are very rare to find nowadays because the sea urchin populations are so large. In 1968, the government of British Columbia reintroduced sea otters on part of the coast, and the results were almost immediate. In the most repopulated areas, the kelp forests and all of their inhabitants have made a huge comeback. Everything is interconnected here, like links in a chain. Break one link, and the whole chain comes apart.
Summer on the West Coast is coming to an end, and under the leaves of the trees of the rainforest, an amazing story is unfolding, that of a crucial thousand-year-old exchange between the ocean and the forest. It's a story of life and death, of a great destiny, and of an epic journey. It's the story of Salmon. In the icy waters of a mountain river, Pacific salmon have reached the end of their journey. Their ancestors started coming here over six million years ago. They've been coming to this coast since the start of the last ice age, and certainly well before the first humans ever set foot here. Each summer, hundreds of millions of salmon undertake one of the world's most amazing migrations. From the depths of the Pacific Ocean, they swim thousands of kilometers upriver, as far as the deep forest, in order to reproduce at the exact spot where they were born. Their journey literally defines the fate of the West Coast. They are the most important link between the ocean and the forest. Upon contact with the fresh water, the salmon stop feeding and begin an impressive mutation. At the end of their journey, they start to decompose and embark on the last but most important days of their lives. In the darkness of the undergrowth, they're all searching for the ideal spot to deposit their offspring, a gravel bed, neither too small nor too big. A slight current for the oxygen, but not too strong. The female then digs a nest with her tail and delicately deposits her eggs. The male then adds his sperm. After that, the couple need only to protect their treasure while awaiting their own demise. A hundred years of human development have nonetheless greatly altered this epic journey. To maintain plummeting salmon stocks, mankind has come up with a simple and efficient solution. Today in British Columbia, over 10% of the salmon that swim upriver will arrive at vastly different spawning grounds. In the hatchery that substitutes for their gravel beds, salmon are collected and then sorted according to species. The females are stripped of their eggs and the males of their sperm. Then eggs and sperm are mixed together and placed in an incubator. A few months later, a much greater number of young salmon than nature is able to produce is released into the river. Because this allows mankind to maintain not only salmon stocks, but also industrial fishing, hatcheries have become a necessary evil. However, on the coast, certain people have a different take on things. Like when they're all lined up like that, you can just count them one at a time. All right, Rob, I'm gonna work back to you now so we can kind of count these together. I'm Will Atlas. I work for Cux Project Society as Salmon Program Coordinator based in Bella Bella. Well, Cux is a community organization in Bella Bella that has a, almost a 10-year track record of running science programs that support health sick led stewardship of resources that are important to the health sick First Nation. Uh, the Heltzik, or uh, we're a band of uh, First Nations people, have inhabited this place for over 13,000 years and have depended pretty heavily on all of our resources for sustenance and survival. 
probably about 4,000 band members, one of the bigger reserves and tribes on the, on the central coast of British Columbia. We're uh, salmon driven people. Uh, everything that we depend on is to also dependent on salmon. NS stands for natural senescent, basically fish that died naturally after spawning. BK is bear kill, wolf kill. We talk a lot about the sort of salmon crisis or the challenges facing salmon in some ways. And I think that to a certain degree that's true, particularly in places where urbanization, agriculture, forestry, other land use change has essentially fundamentally altered their habitats. 10 NS chums and three NS pinks. Two bear kill chum and a bear kill pink. But still, I mean, in the Central Coast region, we have very intact, you know, healthy habitats. Um, and if you think about uh, intact habitat as the principal in your bank account, you know, we have a very full bank account here. So salmon are well equipped to weather the potential, you know, impacts of the coming century if we can protect habitat or continue to protect habitat here and also make sure that we're not over harvesting these populations moving forward. Six NS pinks. We get an estimate of the total population using mark recite techniques where we walk the spawning creeks in the fall and recite both tagged and untagged fish. And from the ratio of tagged and untagged fish, we're able to expand that to an estimate of the total population size. It can be you know, challenging. It's a long season. We start in mid-April with the smolt trap, and we, we go till the end of July. But overall, I mean, it's a very um, rewarding work, and the guys that we get to work with are, you know, really great. And so there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of jokes, and it's a pretty excellent lifestyle, actually. I mean, it's such a small distance, but I'm curious to see whether there's any sort of asynchrony in, like, some years you have more fish spawning down here than up there, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. We run uh, Fish Weir, where we capture a large number of the sockeye that are migrating upstream to spawn. So a fish weir is a, basically a picket fence in a river, um, and it's designed to sort of channel fish into a certain area. We live on the river, and we monitor the weir, we maintain the weir every day, throughout the day, and we tag the fish with vi individually visible tags. That allows us to look at migration rates through the lower river because we actually conduct snorkel counts twice a week from the lake down to the weir. I mean, there's evidence of weirs going back five or 6,000 years on the BC and Alaska coast. So that's an ancient, ancient technology. There was lots of stories about, you know, the creeks being so full of salmon that you could run across and not get your feet wet. Uh, what we're doing is fighting back, um, looking at a more in-depth approach to salmon populations uh, through projects like the, the Quay Weir so that we can, you know, say, um, you know, X amount of sockeye are in the river. So, you know, you can go ahead and fish or it's a dry season. Um, no more fishing until the sockeye can get in the river. Just pulling out the otoliths, which is the ear bone. And the otolith, like a ring of a tree, records growth rings for every year of the fish's life. And, but you can tell the years by the by a tightening of the rings, which is indicative of slower growth during winter. So these otoliths will basically tell us how long each of these fish spent at sea before returning. And so when they were sp spawned in the gravel here at Quay. Salmon have always been, you know, a resource that is fundamentally, when best managed, managed at a local scale. And so I think the people that live, you know, in and around the watersheds where salmon return, ought to be the ones that principally harvest them and manage them. They also have, you might say, more skin in the game. They have more at stake. Well, the future is now. Uh, if we don't stand up for these sockeye populations, for these grizzly bears, for these trees, for, for all of these resources in the land and sea that don't have a voice, then none of our, none of our um, children to come are going to have the opportunity to live the life that we're living right now. Spring has arrived on Kauai River, and life comes into its own again. From the icy waters that have seen their parents' demise, young salmon emerge. 
These in turn will soon let themselves be carried off by the current towards the Pacific waters, so that they too can fulfill their great destiny. Damien is now in the Great Bear Rainforest, along with bear expert Tim Irvin, where they'll try to observe grizzly bears. Because they eat so much salmon, grizzly bears are actually key players when it comes to the flow of nutrients from sea to forest. This beaver hydroplane will transport the camera crew and all their equipment to a floating lodge in the heart of the Smith Estuary, in the middle of grizzly bear country. Yeah, they're pretty amazing boats, eh? Yeah. What I love about being here is all like the, you know, all this mist and everything in the trees, right? Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, oh, it's just so, um, it's so beautiful and has a real ethereal feel to it. Why is it such a special place for the, for the bears there? Well, I think that the first part is that this is the biggest piece of temperate rainforest left in the world. Here in the Great Bear Rainforest, it's, um, yeah, it's the largest intact piece. And so just on that note alone, because there's a big intact wilderness here, it means there's a lot of good habitat for bears. It's not interrupted by human activities in the way that it is in many other parts of the world. And the other thing about this environment that makes it really great for bears and, and supports a lot of bears is that it's a really productive environment. We have the ocean and the forest, and they mingle together, so it becomes a very rich environment with a lot of uh, nutrient sharing between the ocean and the forest, and there's a lot of food, so it can support a lot more bears than some more sparse environments. But then in the fall, when you get that concentrated food source in the form of salmon in the river valley, you know, we could have as many as between 40 and 60 bears using this, this river valley. That's impressive. So we'll get out here and we'll head upstreams where you can get uh, a better chance to see s salmon spawning in the shallow water where bears can get access to it. Okay. We're getting up towards the, where the fish are spawning. Okay. Where the bears are actively hunting the salmon. So we have to be really careful because uh, we could bump into a bear literally at any moment here. It hey is, bear. It is pretty dense here, yeah? It's really dense. The sight lines aren't very good, so you hear me yelling hay bear every now and then. Okay. That's so we don't startle a bear. The worst thing you want to do is startle a bear because you force it to make a fast decision, and if it chooses to defend itself, it's very dangerous for us. You smell that? Mm-hmm. It smells a bit rotten there. It smells... It smells something stinky. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got something up here. Hey, bear. Oh, yeah, it smells pretty strong. Wow, yeah. Check this out. Some leftovers? Yeah, we're hot on the trail now. What do you think we've got here? That's some salmon there. Yeah, so this looks like a, this is the, what's left of a chum salmon. You can actually see the jaws here. You can see these big teeth. Yeah. Chum salmon get these really large, enlarged teeth during spawning that they use to attract females and fight off other males. And definitely not much left of this guy. Mm -hmm. But you can see those giant teeth uh, that are very typical of a, a spawning chum salmon, especially a male. They get really enlarged. In some ways, it's kind of like, um, you think of like the really large antlers on a moose, uh, really which seems to be part teeth, of the yeah. sexual selection of, of these species. Yeah, they're, they're really impressive. Oh. What happens to the, what's left of all this? If we came back in a few days, this would be covered in maggots, mm -hmm. and you come back a few days later and just be stripped clean, just be a perfect skeleton. <clears throat> but what happens is, um, the bear's gonna wander off, and the bear's gonna, uh, urinate and defecate in the forest and it's going to take all the nutrients from this fish and spread it around the forest as it does that. In the meantime, the nutrients from this carcass are going to melt into the forest and be absorbed by the roots. So these salmon are born here in these rivers in the forest. They go out to the ocean and they absorb all these nutrients from the ocean. They come back up here and they die and the, the bears and the wolves and, the, and these nutrients get absorbed. So what's really amazing is if you, when you look at the cross sections of these trees, what you'll find is that the really big salmon runs 
correspond ex exactly with the large growth rings in the trees. What happens is the trees sort of nurture the, the river, keep the water temperature low by shading it, reducing erosion, provides this great nursery for the fish, and in turn the fish come back and fertilize the trees. It's an amazing cycle that keeps amazing this forest cycle. going. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Come here, Damien, come here. There's mother, there's mother and two cubs over there. Right there, you yeah. See them through the woods? Yeah. Wow, she's a beautiful bear. So big. Yeah, yeah, she's a healthy bear. Oh, and you can see the salmon's jumping around. Yeah, so you can see, see what I mean? See how the sh shallow water over there? Yeah. You can actually see the tails of the salmon out of the water. Wow. Yeah, those cubs are pretty healthy looking here. Take a look. This is a great place for those bears and a good place for us. Definitely. Nice. Nice found, really, really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you can see that, you can see that big muscle on her shoulder there? Uh -huh. That's a really nice way to tell a black bear from a grizzly bear, because grizzlies have those, that big hump on their shoulders, big digging muscles. Oh, there she goes, there she goes. Oh, it's chasing you. get it? Oh. Sometimes make, people make it sound like it's easy for them, and it's not. You know, they miss more than they succeed. We've already seen her miss a couple Quite times a here already, you know? Yeah. And you know, it's the cubs, they're learning here. Like, you can see them taking a few runs at the fish, but at this age, their success rate at catching their own fish is probably pretty poor. Most of the time, she'll catch a fish, she'll start eating it, and the cubs will walk over and start chewing on it, and eventually she'll walk away and let them have it. Oh, look, he's, he's got one there. You see the, the mm -hmm. tail? Oh, I'm bringing it back. Yeah. Pretty good lifestyle. So this is kind of exactly what we talked about. You saw that bear going to the woods there. Mm -hmm. It's taking that fish into the woods. It's going to consume it in the woods. It's going to leave the carcass in there. So what you find is bears are an amazing nutrient transport system because they take a lot of fish and they actually move them into the river. The bears barely notice the presence of Damien and Tim. They're far too busy fishing for dinner. After all, there's not that much time left to fatten up before salmon stocks dry up and winter sets in. By next month, these bears will eat up to 40 kilograms of fish and gain almost a kilogram a day. In general, these young grizzlies use techniques they've picked up from their mothers with varying degrees of success, but practice makes perfect. If fishing sometimes goes unrewarded, at least these bears still know how to have some fun. If these cubs manage to eat their fill, they'll grow up to weigh almost 400 kilograms of muscle and fur. They'll then be able to teach, in turn, the subtle art of fishing to their offspring, thereby ensuring the survival of their species. Being born, growing up, reproducing and dying, and then relinquishing our flesh to nourish the environment that sustained us. Such is the universal and eternal cycle of life. Imagine a place where that cycle occurs away from prying eyes. A place forgotten by the rest of the world, where wild nature still reigns supreme over all living things. A benevolent ruler whose laws dictate when the sun will rise and when it will set. Imagine a place where time is marked by the rhythm of the waves, by the beating of the wings of birds or the blows of whales. That place actually exists here in the Great Bear Rainforest, 
For thousands of years, life has been perpetuating itself, unbeknownst to the rest of the world. The virginal purity of this secret garden is like a haven of simplicity in a forever changing world. Between two clouds, you can sometimes spot some human or other come to cast a light on this Eden amidst the world of men. You know, when we first came up here, it was known as the Mid-Coast Timber Supply Area. Uh, it was really just seen as a place to extract raw resources. And there was no other non-government organization working on conservation issues here. It was, it was wide open. And this is a coastline that I've been exploring for 20 plus years. And I realized that I would have to live many more lifetimes to fully see it all. It's, it's that large of a, of a wilderness area. It's special on so many levels. Globally, there's just few coastlines uh, that are associated with a huge island archipelago, uh, such as we have here, uh, that support you know, many globally rare species. Uh, our work is primarily wildlife uh, conservation. It's really important to build public support for protecting such a large area. So we get involved in uh, uh, public education projects such as films and uh, uh, books and popular magazine articles, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, film work and photography and, and really, you know, visual storytelling. Yeah, it could be around the corner or sometimes when the tide drops, the, they, they can access fish uh, down lower. And not far. This is interesting. Oh, wow. So you can see, see this is all from wolves uh, lying down, pups playing. See how it's all kind of mm -hmm. over there. Uh, but this is black bear here, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. One less black bear. They don't really like bears in their fishing spots. They claim certain areas where they fish, and if a bear comes in, they'll often attack it. Uh, goal today is to document uh, fishing behavior, which is uh, uh, you know quite an important part of our work, trying to understand the importance of salmon uh, to uh, numerous species, but wolves in particular. That is a high definition PTZ camera, which the camera can, you know, it's like you're standing here and you're looking around, you can zoom all over the estuary. Um, so that, that information is being transmitted back to our lab where we're streaming it online and recording it in, in high quality as well. Um, and we're watching it there and we're kind of putting that out to the world so people can kind of connect with this area and what's happening at this time of year. We're just sitting at 6.5 and 6.5 now. So maybe where it was. I put, I put it back to where it was, man. Okay, I'll just give it a second, see what happens here. If this thing loads, you can see actually what, what it looks like when we're controlling the camera. It's going pretty slow right now, so I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. A lot of wolves, especially in this area, are kind of what we're mainly looking for, but you know, you'll find like just incredible bird life through here, lots of eagles hanging out often, and a whole bunch of ravens. Sometimes we get some bears and things like that too, and just being able to watch the salmon kind of move through this river too is pretty phenomenal. So it's pretty useful for us for, for monitoring wildlife. It's good enough that we can get a really good understanding of what the animals are doing in the area. Oh uh, yeah, that's happening right now. So there's a salmon right there. Swimming around, you can see in there. There's a couple of them. It's something you don't necessarily come across every day in your life to be able to interact with animals in, in kind of their environment in that way. So it's another nice thing I like about this job. <laughs> 
by, by photographing and filming, documenting these animals and, and this place, um, we're able to, to essentially make people aware of its existence and secondly, make them fall in love with it. And thirdly, want to do everything they can to protect it. So I think it's, a, I think it's an extremely powerful way to, to bring people in. I mean, can you imagine if the entire world was was a concrete jungle and we seem to have forgotten that that we are from places like these and this is where we we used to live and we used to live by by catching fish and and off of these resources. So there's this disconnect with nature, but we need this habitat as much as as the animals do. Just because we don't rely on it anymore doesn't mean it it isn't essential for our existence. Damien and Francois Xavier have met up in Carmana Walbrand Forest, west of Vancouver Island. This old growth forest represents the last stage of the Pacific salmon cycle. In this rainforest, reminiscent of the Amazon jungle, roads are rare and bridges even rarer. However, the team is getting help from a couple of first-rate guides. Andy McKinnon is a renowned Canadian botanist. Matthew Beatty is an arborist specializing in climbing giant trees. Together, they'll try to climb one of the oldest trees in the area in order to explore its canopy. Lashing rain for three days straight. Just today, we must have gotten at least 60 millimeters of rain, if not more. Oh, it's a beautiful rainforest rain, Francois. And this is in the summertime. This is what it's like when it's dry in the rainforest. We should come back and have a look when it's humid. How high do the, the trees come up to here? Oh, we're, we're gonna see a couple above 200 feet for sure. 200, okay. How do you get the first um, rope up the, the tree? Uh, we're gonna be using this, Big Shot. It's a okay. tool we use in the industry for installing pilot lines. And... Whoa, look at this tree. Oh, wow. That could be the one, Damien. That might be the one. Yeah. Wow, look at the life up there. Yeah, it's so massive. Now that's a magnificent tree. A Western red cedar, perhaps eight to 900 years old at a minimum. Lots of little moss beds around too. Yeah, there's lots of, lots of life up in that canopy. It's amazing. Yeah. It's got everything we're looking for. All right, let's do it. Okay. Perfect. While Damien and Matthew get ready to climb the tree, Andy and Francois Xavier will continue exploring the rainforest. For me, the most impressive thing about this forest is its size. The sheer size of these giant trees as we make our way through the forest. Andy, I think, like, the most impressive about this forest is its size, right? How, how come the trees are so big? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that here on the West Coast, they can grow practically year-round if the temperature doesn't get too cold. Right. So they're evergreen trees, so they get plenty of moisture for growth. The tropical rainforests uh, have similar amounts of total annual rainfall, but in terms of biomass, there are no ecosystems on Earth that come close to these uh, coastal temperate rainforests. Oh, really? We see a lot of young trees, but also very old trees. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's one of the characteristics of old growth forests that sets them aside from the managed second growth forests. The old growth forests have a relatively small number of stems per hectare, usually, mm -hmm. but they come in all sizes and ages 
and some are alive and some are dead. And so they provide habitat for a wide range of different organisms. So if you go to a forest that has been cut down and, and replanted or regenerated naturally, what you generally find is a forest very simplified structurally and very simplified biologically compared to the, the richness that we see in an old growth forest. What's going on, Matt? Meantime, Damien and Matt have come up against a huge setback. The part of the tree where Matt started climbing turned out to be dead. It just emitted a loud crack under the climber's weight. So it looks like the tree's a bit unstable. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely knew that, but... Oh, yeah, it went all the way up, too. Remember I was saying how uh, some trees just give you that impression that they don't want to be climbed. Um, I think we're making a good call by considering another specimen somewhere. So you all heard it, though? It wasn't just me? Oh, I, no, no, I didn't hear anything. Yeah. I think <laughs> you, you guys. Yeah, we've got other options. And what I find fascinating in these forests is the relationships between the, all these different species. Oh, yes, yeah, they're, they're certainly all connected in the forests here. Uh, you can talk about these sorts of relationships, these connections above ground. Some of the more interesting connections, I think, are below ground. Uh, all of the plants that we see in the forest here, about 94% of plants on Earth, have fungi associated with their roots, and these fungi, their little filaments, go through the soil and they gather water and minerals for the plants and the plants photosynthesize, make sugars and send the sugars down to their roots to help feed the fungi. I'm trying to find some roots that might have some indication of it here. So if you look at the tips of the roots here, you'll see that the very tips of the roots there are white. You right. see that? Yeah. And that is the fungi wrapped around the root tips. Oh. And there, from there, the microscopic threads would spread through the soil, gather water and minerals, and bring them back to the plant root because availability of nitrogen is the thing that's limiting growth in these forests. So to the extent that these fungi can help gather nitrogen, and make it available to the plants, then the plants will grow more quickly. So there aren't really that many sources of nitrogen for the forests here. But if you're near a river like this in the coastal temperate rainforest, mm -hmm. probably your major source of nitrogen for tree growth is salmon. The tree that we are going to climb, there will be nitrogen from the salmon in that tree. From the ocean to the river, and from the river to the very tops of the trees of the forest, the salmon have finally reached the end of their long journey. Through their incredible destiny, they've created a crucial link between the ocean and the thousand-year-old trees of the forest. Our two friends have made their way through this lost world, the mysterious canopy of the rainforest. These tall and well-rooted trees literally act as the spinal columns of the world. Their leaves collect energy from the sun to the great benefit of all earthly creatures, all the while releasing torrents of water into the atmosphere. Their branches and trunks harbor a host of animals, insects, and plants. The trees of this forest are among the oldest creatures on the planet. Their lives go back far longer than ours, and far longer than our human experience and collective memory. Trees are remarkable beings. Damien, wait till you see this, this moss mat here, brother. Beautiful. I can't wait. It's massive. Yeah, check this out. Come on, it's a bit. It's a couple feet thick, like the, the soil accumulation is just incredible. Oh, well. It's actually quite, quite an impressive size. Huckleberry growing out of it too. It's been there for a while. It's brilliant. So there's quite a few different species growing on this tree already. Yeah, that's right. It's really um, metaphoric of an apartment complex of of uh, all sorts of species. Brilliant. Yeah. And 
and there's that interconnectedness, that interdependency of old growth forests where you know the, the network of species really rely upon one another and mm -hmm. um, so you take you take an important link out and um, it'll it'll potentially disrupt the rest of the functions of the ecosystem the tree that damien and matt are exploring is over a thousand years old a thousand years ago the inca civilization hadn't yet arisen and constantinople had yet to fall when Christopher Columbus set foot on American soil, this tree was already a nearly 500-year-old giant. These great trees are guardians of time. They've seen civilizations come and go. They've seen men being born only to die soon afterwards. The rainforest, like the rest of nature, imposes humility and respect on the human race. But as Matthew Beattie put it, the mighty forest must also grapple with immense vulnerability like a giant with brittle bones, and mankind has the power to either destroy it or protect it. <laughs>